Let's look into hypothesis tests for one population variance. So we're going to be testing the null hypothesis here that the population variance sigma squared is equal to some hypothesized value sigma naught squared. Suppose we are sampling n independent observations from a normally distributed population with variance sigma squared. Our sample variance s squared is going to estimate the population variance sigma squared. And we may wish to conduct some hypothesis tests to investigate the true value of sigma squared. Assuming we are sampling from a normally distributed population, this statistic here has a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Before we draw our sample, s squared here is a random variable, and thus this entire quantity is a random variable. And this random variable has a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And we are going to base our hypothesis test on this idea. So we are simply going to replace this true value of sigma squared down here with our hypothesized value of sigma squared in our test statistic. So to test the null hypothesis that sigma squared is equal to this hypothesized value, we are simply going to use this test statistic, which was what we had up top, except now we've got our hypothesized value of sigma squared down there. Now if the null hypothesis and the assumptions are true, then this statistic will have a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so we're going to base our p-values or our rejection regions on that notion. Now let's take a look at the different scenarios here. Suppose our alternative hypothesis is that sigma squared is greater than sigma naught squared. Well, if that's true, if sigma squared is in fact greater than the hypothesized value, then typically we're going to expect this s squared to be greater than this sigma squared value, and this test statistic is going to tend to be large. So the larger the value of this test statistic for a given degrees of freedom, the greater the evidence against the null hypothesis. And that's how we get our p-values. So if I draw out here, say, if this is my chi-square distribution, it's my chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, then I get a test statistic, I calculate its value, and suppose this is our chi-square test statistic here. I'm going to call it our chi-square test stat. Well, since large values of the test statistic give us evidence against the null hypothesis, the p-value is going to be the probability of getting this value or something even larger under the null hypothesis, and this is going to be our p-value. And if we were using the rejection region approach, we would choose a rejection region in the right tail of the distribution. On the flip side of things, if our alternative hypothesis is that sigma squared is less than the hypothesized value, then our s squared is typically going to be less than our sigma naught squared, and our chi-square test statistic here is going to tend to be small. And so what we're going to do if we draw out our chi-square distribution here, again, this is a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and I'm going to calculate the value of my test statistic and my chi-square test statistic, and so I'll write that chi-square test stat. But small values of the test statistic give us evidence against the null hypothesis, and so our p-value is going to be the probability of getting this number or something even smaller, or in other words, the area to the left out here. And so under this alternative hypothesis, my p-value is the area to the left of my calculated test statistic. And if we were using the rejection region approach, we would choose a rejection region in the left tail of the distribution. Now if our alternative hypothesis is that sigma squared is not equal to the hypothesized value, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis for very large values of the test statistic or very small values of the test statistic. So if this is our chi-square distribution, with our n minus 1 degrees of freedom again. And suppose, just suppose, we get a chi-square test statistic here. So we calculate our test statistic and we get that. So that's our chi-square test stat from above. Now our p-value is going to be the smaller area doubled. So we're going to look at this area out here or this area out here and say that our p-value is twice the smaller area. Is double the smaller area. And that gives us the probability of getting a test statistic this extreme or even more extreme. And if we were using the rejection region approach, we would have rejection regions in both tails of the distribution. Let's look at an example here. At a cereal filling plant, quality control engineers do not want the variance of the weights of 750 gram cereal boxes to exceed 100 grams squared. 
gram squared, the units of the variance, because the variance is a squared quantity. So one thing we might be interested in, there's different ways of looking at this type of problem, but one thing we might be interested in is testing the null hypothesis that the variance is equal to 100 and seeing if we have strong evidence that the variance is actually greater than 100. A sample of seven boxes of this type of cereal with a nominal weight of 750 grams had the following weights. So I've got seven weights listed here. This is actually real data based on seven boxes that I haphazardly selected from a store. So let's pretend for the sake of illustration that this actually represents a simple random sample from the population. If you calculate our sample variance for these values using our formulas from long ago, we see that our variance is equal to 315.5714. And the question we're asking here is, does this sample provide strong evidence that the true variance of the weights exceeds that 100 grams squared? So we want to test this null hypothesis that the true variance is equal to 100, or equivalently, that the standard deviation is equal to 10, against the alternative hypothesis that the variance is actually greater than that 100. And now we're going to calculate our chi-square test statistic, and our chi-square value is going to be n minus 1 times s squared over sigma naught squared. And this works out to 7 minus 1, because we had those 7 boxes of cereal, times 315.5714 over the hypothesized value of 100. And this is 18.934 to 3 decimal places. Now, our alternative hypothesis is that the variance is greater than 100. So I draw out my chi-square distribution here, and this is my chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, or 6 degrees of freedom. And my test statistic value is 18.934. And since my alternative hypothesis is greater than, I want the area to the right. This is my p-value. Now if I use a computer package like R, so I'm going to say using R because I used a computer to get the actual value here, I get a p-value of approximately 0 0.0043, four decimal places. If I were to use a table, we're not going to be able to get an exact value. We're going to be able to get a range of values. We're going to get something like, if well, if you use my table, you get that the p-value is less than 0 0.005 and greater than 0 0.001. And I have other videos showing how to get that number. In any event, this p-value is quite small. That is a small p-value giving us strong evidence against the null hypothesis and strong evidence in favor of this alternative hypothesis. Now, if we had a given alpha level, like suppose we had a given alpha level of alpha is 0.05, we would see that the p-value is less than that 0.05 and the evidence against the null hypothesis would be significant at 5%. Here, there isn't a given alpha level, but we still should be able to come up with something reasonable. This value is quite small, and in most practical purposes, that's considered to be a small p-value with strong evidence against the null hypothesis. And so we could say something like there is very strong evidence with this p-value of approximately 0 0.004 that the true variance of weights in serial boxes of this type is actually greater than 100. Now I feel it necessary to give a little warning here that these methods can work very poorly when the normality assumption is violated. So if these methods have some practical importance for you, I suggest you consult with a statistician to make sure you're going about things the right way.